thank you. Thank you all for, for being back. I've been asked uh, to provide some references, of course. <laughs> of course, you will not be able to digest all of this at once. <laughs> but uh, as another service, I have put all my slides on my home page. They are all there. So um, if you prefer, if you prefer uh, to look at the slides, you can do so now. Just uh, look at my home page and follow the link of presentations. Okay? Presentations. Okay. Today I have uh, four sections. Notions of representation theory for those who know and for those who don't know yet. Uh, what are some of the problems in representation theory of finite groups? And then I want to present Harish Chandra introduction. One of the principal uh, basic concepts in this theory, ibahori hecke algebras and Harish Chandra series, which is uh, a way of, uh, of um, dividing up the set of all irreducible representations of the groups we are looking at into smaller pieces. Okay, notions of representation theory. Well, you can do this for any group and for any field, and then you have a K representation. It's just the homomorphism uh, of the group into a vector space, uh, into the general linear group of a vector space. And this is also called the representation of G on V, and most of the time, or almost all of the time, you will consider finite dimensional representations. Uh, so that means the vector space V has finite dimension, and then of course you are only representing a finite quotient of the group G. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry, no. D is finite, it's the degree. Yeah. Uh, the obvious notion is that of an uh, irreducible representation. This is one which is not uh, reducible, and reducible is easier to explain. So. If the representation is on the on the vector space V, we look at invariant subspaces that are subspaces, proper subspaces, uh, non-zero, which are invariant under all representing automorphisms coming from the group G. And uh, if you have such a subspace, you can restrict all the uh, matrices <coughs> or automorphisms uh, to this subspace and you get an induced automorphism on the quotient space. That means from a reducible representation, you get two new representations which are of smaller degree if you start with a representation of a finite degree. Uh, and if this is not possible, the representation is irreducible. And as the simpler groups are the atoms of finite group theory, the irreducible representations are the atoms of representation theory. Of course, there is a natural notion of equivalence of k-representations, which just means that the representing automorphisms, so you have, say, two representations of the same group on the same vector space are equivalent if they are simultaneously uh, similar, by one simultaneous transformation. So if you have a finite dimensional vector space, you can look at the chain of invariant subspaces, which is as long as possible, so that in between there are no, uh, yeah, the, you can rephrase this as the, the representation induced on, the, on, the, uh, on these uh, quotients are irreducible. And then if you choose a basis of your vector space V, which goes through this chain of subspaces, uh, and look at the representing matrices, you get a matrix representation for the group G, and uh, this is a block upper triangular matrix with the same size of blocks for all group elements G, the size is coming from the dimensions of these quotient spaces. And so these uh, representations which are induced on such a maximal chain of invariant subspaces uh, the composition factors of the original representation X or the irreducible constituents and one of the principal theorems is they are unique even if you take another uh, longest chain of invariant subspaces 
uh, you will not get uh, maybe the same uh, factors, but uh, you have a permutation on the factors and an isomorphism on the or an equivalence on the corresponding uh, subquotients. So this is the Jordan Hölder theorem. So any representation gives rise to a set of irreducible representations which are attached to the original representation by this construction. <clears throat> and of course, to work with matrix representation can sometimes be uh, somewhat clumsy and uh, you see, if you have, of course, if you have matrices, you, you cannot just multiply matrices, you can add them. And so you need something which is equivalent to adding matrices on the side of the, of the group. And this is the group algebra. So um, if you have a K representation, just, uh, I mean, for simplicity of notation, you suppress this letter X and uh, all the brackets and you just replace it by a dot. And this makes V into an FKG module, where KG is just the set of all formal linear combinations of group elements with uh, finite sums, finite sums, and uh, with a multiplication which, which is inherit from, inherited from the multiplication of G and the distributed law holds. So this is the group algebra, a fundamental object. So it's the <coughs> it's the, the monoid ring. Uh, with respect to the mono EG and the, and the ring K. Yeah. And then you, you can rephrase the terms from representation theory in, in, into modular theoretic terms. For example, a representation is irreducible if and only if V is simple as KG module because an invariant subspace W of V is nothing but a sub module, a KG submodule. And representations are equivalent if and only if the modules are isomorphic and, and so on and so forth. So this is just a translation of, of notions, but it's sometimes more convenient to work with modules. And it's a fundamental fact, if the group is finite, never mind what the field is, there are only finitely many irreducible representations up to equivalence. Only finitely many. Um, and I mean, the reason is that an irreducible representation is isomorphic to a quotient of the group algebra. And the quotient of the group algebra, I mean, to I mean just take any vector inside this uh, irreducible simple module and then consider the map. So if, if V is simple, you can consider the map from KG to V if you take an element which is non-zero in V sending a group algebra element to A times V the image is a non-trivial submodule, and so this V, and the kernel, this is a, a, a module map, the kernel is a maximum submodule of KG, so a V is isomorphic to a quotient, and then you take a filtration, which is a composition series of KG, and V is one of these, and by the modern Hölder theorem, there are only finite many. But so why is this uncertainty? If V is simple, the image, because it's an algebra, oh. The image is submodule, and it's non-zero because I have started with it. So now coming back to yesterday's classification theorem of the finite simple groups, uh, you agree? I do hope that it's a fundamental task to classify all the irreducible representations of all finite simple groups and maybe related groups such as quasi-simple covering groups or finite groups or automorphism groups of finite simple groups and the like. This is, I mean, as I said yesterday, chemistry did not end when the atoms were discovered. I mean, you have to find out how the atoms can be glued together to make new molecules. And I mean, representation theory and this information can be used to find these new things. Well, what do I mean by classify? This is, of course, not very precise, but the first step would be 
to find a given a, given a finite simple group. And we have a, a very nice description, as, as I tried to convince you yesterday, of these finite simple groups into classes of, of classical groups and exceptional groups and Steinberg groups and twisted groups and 26 correct groups and alternating groups. So it's a, it essentially it's a, it's a finite set of data you can describe all these groups. So maybe uh, we can find labels for the irreducible representations and then once we have a nice set of labels, we want to derive properties of the representation. And first principal property, for example, is the degree of an irreducible representation. You can think of. Okay, so let's concentrate on uh, groups of Lie type uh, for the sporadic gamma. I will mean, say something uh, on the sporadic groups uh, tomorrow. Okay, so okay, back to my setup. Maybe I write it here because maybe it's difficult. So G is an algebraic group. Maybe a simple algebraic group or maybe uh, not quite simple, like uh, think of G, L, N, F. F is an algebraic enclosed field, and F, this bold phase F is the algebraic closure of the finite field with <coughs> each element. Huh? F is a Frobenius morphism. A Frobenius morphism, so think of uh, a matrix Aij goes to Aij to the Q or some power Q of P. So if you think of GLNF, I think you have a good picture in mind. So now let's K be an algebraic enclosed field. I mean, representation theory makes sense over any field, even over any commutative ring, even over some non-commutative rings. But I mean, to begin with, let's stick to algebraic enclosed <coughs> fields to uh, to get some uh, technical problems out of the way. And then it's natural to distinguish three cases. The first case is the characteristic of K can be equal to P, this P, which is the defining characteristic of the underlying group. So this is the defining characteristic K, and it's usual to take the same field F over which the group is originally defined. So I'm not going to talk on this case. This uses uh, representation theory of Lie algebras and of algebraic groups, and uh, a lot is known in this case. We have labels, for example, for the irreducible representations, uh, but we don't have the degrees. We are far away from having the degrees. A nice set of labels, but no degrees. Ordinary representations, is if the characteristic is zero, and this is the best situation where we know most. And then there is another case where the characteristic is not equal to P. Actually, infinitely many cases, if you like. So this can be any finite prime L different from P. This is the non-defining characteristic case. But in this series of lectures, because there are only three lectures, I'm going to concentrate on this case. And I will say a little bit on the third case, but only very little. And of course, we assume that G is finite. G is, you know, G is the finite group, GF. And in our example, for example, GLNQ. And the modules will be finite dimensional. OK. I have tried to convince you yesterday that a good way of looking at the groups is as groups with Bn pair. So let me recall if G is GLNQ, the finite group, uh, the B is the set of upper triangular matrices, the N is the set of monomial matrices. And to have a split BN pair, you also need uh, the unipotent subgroup, yeah, and T, B intersect N is T. This is the set of diagonal matrices. And you also have uh, 
factorization uh, into u. So the b is u times t. So maybe I, I write it here. The b is u times t, and the u is the set of unipotent upper triangular matrices. <coughs> Okay. Arising from this set of axioms and uh, the overgroups of the, the bor B is the Borel subgroup, the overgroups are parabolic subgroups. And every parabolic subgroup has a Levy decomposition, U times L, where U is a normal subgroup in P and L is the complement. <coughs> And now, if you if you if you want to look at an example <coughs> in the general linear groups, you get a block diagonal matrices. This is L and the U. So this is L and the U is the set of corresponding matrices where you have identity matrices here. Yeah. So you have a whole bunch of Levy subgroups which are just smaller groups of the same type, or direct products of groups of the same type. And I told you that we want to use this as a base of, of mathematical induction. These are all the examples of conjugation? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, not quite. I mean, you can have, uh, I, will, I will have an example. If you take, instead of this, if you take the, the lower <coughs> block triangular matrices, uh, you will have the same Levy subgroup, but non conjugate parabolic subgroups. Okay, so if you have a so the point is, of course, the U is normal, so you get, you always get uh, an epimorphic, uh, an epimorphism onto L. And if you have a representation of L uh, on a on a on a module M, you can pull it back, which is called the inflation. Okay, so M M tilde is the inflation, and so. I mean, one principal tool in representation theory is to start with subgroups and take a module for the subgroup and then use induction. There's a process of an induced module. But the problem here is, if you start with a Levy subgroup and do this induction process, the Levy subgroup is somehow too small. The index is too large. But it lies in a very large subgroup, maybe the corresponding parabolic subgroup. So what we do is, we view this module for L as a module for P, just by pulling the representation back. And then we have a, well, what is it? A construction which makes a new module for G from this module, for, from this module M. And formally, it's just the, the KP homomorphisms from the left regular. So KG is the group algebra, it's a module for KP. And M tilde is a module for P by a construction. So it's if you like, it's the set of all maps from Kg to M, which are left invariant under the action of P. It's modular forms. It's modeled after modular forms. And this is a, the Harichandra induced module. The action of G is just by right translation in the argument. So such a map F translated by a group element G is just a right translation in, in the argument. And this is, of course, again, if F was left invariant under the action of P, this will be left invariant again just by the associativity law in the group. So this is a co-induced module rather than an induced module. But in, since the groups are, yeah, I have already said, this, is, this definition is originally due to Harish Chandra. And it's really modeled after, after modular forms. Um, and it's, since the groups are finite, this is naturally isomorphic to the, this induced module. And this is the usual way of inducing modules from a subgroup P 
uh, to Chile. Well, I have used this parabolic subgroup P to define it, but the theorem, one of the main theorems, which is not so old as it happens, if P is invertible in K, even if K is not a field, I mean, you can do this construction, this is independent of the choice of P with maybe complement L. This <coughs> essentially only depends on L, where independent means if you take two functors, I mean L, you start with L, you take two different Levy subgroups with, a, with a L as Levy, uh, two different parabolic subgroups with L as Levy complement, you get uh, naturally equivalent functors. So this theorem is due to Lustig back in the 1970s, if K is a field of characteristic zero, to Dipper and Du, if K is a field of characteristic not equal to P, but positive characteristic, and to Howlett and Lehrer, who gave a, a nice conceptual proof uh, where K not necessarily is a field. This is just a ring theoretic argument. I mean, certain elements have to be invertible. They really, really construct the isomorphism. So what does it really mean? What, 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 look at this Levy subgroup in GL3 of Q. And this is related to your question. We have, at least, we have uh, two parabolic subgroups, the, the, the upper triangle, block triangular matrices, or the lower block triangular matrices. And these two, if you like, this is, uh, this is uh, the stabilizer of a, of, of a, um, of a line, and the other one is a stabilizer of a hyperplane. These two groups are not conjugate inside the finite group, but still, the induced module are isomorphic. Yeah. So this is um, not completely trivial theorem. Yeah. So from now on we suppress the P, and so we have uh, essentially we have defined a functor. Uh, starting with an L, we have defined a functor from the module category of finitely generated or finite dimensional modules for L over our field K, uh, where P is invertible, to the module category of G. And now we want to investigate, so these modules are the Harajandra induced modules, so this functor is Harajandra induction from L to G, this is a module for, for L. L is a Levy subgroup, one of these guys, where we by induction know everything, and so we want to investigate these modules by their endomorphism ring. So this is just, if you like, a set of all matrices uh, commuting with all representing matrices. Well, this is the centralizer algebra, so it's just the endomorphism ring. It's a finite dimensional K algebra, uh, the Hecke algebra of this induced module. And this is used to analyze the submodules and the quotient modules and uh, and things like that, and this is what I'm trying to, to show you a little. So how, how can an endomorphism algebra be used to analyze a module? And the easiest, most simple-minded uh, first of set of results is, is fitting correspondence, which is very old. So this works for any, any ring A. So with A be a ring, X an A module, and look at its endomorphism algebra. And now the fitting correspondent relates a direct sum decomposition of x. Yeah, so suppose you have a direct sum decomposition of uh, every finite dimensional module over a field. Uh, if the field is a, if A is a group algebra, has a direct decomposition into indecomposable modules, uh, it's trivial because either it's indecomposable or not, and then the two direct summands have smaller dimension. Yeah. And now look at all the endomorphisms that start in X and, and, and end up in, in one of these Xi's. And uh, we can view this again as a subset by embedding Xi back into, into X, of course. And then these Ei's are ideals of the endomorphism algebra and we have a corresponding decomposition <coughs> of the algebra into these, as it happens, right ideals. If you start with left modules, if you don't like right ideals, you have the opposite algebra of E. And then, yeah. Anyway, so 
direct sums, some decompositions of modules correspond to direct decompositions of the endomorphism algebra into ideals. And uh, isomorphism is preserved. And indecomposability is preserved. So this is fitting correspondence. And if you remember a little bit of representation theory of finite dimensional algebras, if you, if you look at indecomposable direct summons of the algebra, so if these are indecomposable, then you know they have a unique maximum submodule, and the quotient is simple, and all the symbols of the algebra are obtained this way. Yeah, so for a, a decomposition of an algebra into indecomposable direct summons, uh, you recover all the simple modules for the algebra by looking at the, in, uh, at the simple quotients of these direct summons. So this is an important link between the structure of a module, at least as far as direct sum decompositions are concerned, and, um, and the structure of E. Okay, the Coxeter groups appeared as uh, yeah, generalizations of Weyl groups. Just let me recall what a Coxeter group is. We have a symmetric matrix with integer entries, uh, and then you have a, a group presented by uh, in this way. So this is a Coxeter group corresponding to this matrix M, and these elements S1 to SR are the Coxeter generators, and they turn out to be involutions. And these relations are called the break relations because they can be written as SI, SJ, SI is equal to SJ, SI, SJ, where on each side you have MIJ terms. So this is a Coxeter group. Every group which has such a representation is a Coxeter group. And now one of the many, one of the many new structures you can build out of a Coxeter group or a Coxeter presentation is a corresponding ibahori hecke algebra. By deforming these quadratic relations slightly. So we start with the Coxeter group, with the presentation as before. And now we, we need a set of parameters, which are elements in K. We need one parameter for, for each generator of the Coxeter group, but in such a way that the parameters are equal if the corresponding generators in the Coxeter group are conjugate. Yeah? So for example, if you start with a with a simply laced Coxeter diagram and an irreducible Coxeter group, uh, you only have one parameter allowed because all of these simple generators are conjugate. And now you make an algebra out of this. So this is a, a presentation as a K-algebra. Uh, you have generators, one generator for each of these principal, uh, principal involutions, principal reflections. And now you have the break relations as before. You have the break relations as before, but the quadratic relation is deformed in a sense. So it's just a, a, ter, a, a sum of two terms. So this one is the, the one element of the algebra. And so you see, uh, yeah, well, it's a basic fact. Uh, it's a, it's, uh, it's one of the basic facts about this Hegel algebra that it's a free algebra which has a K basis in bijection with the elements of W. So its dimension is the same as the, the order of the, of the Coxeter group, if it's finite. But of course, you can do this for infinite Coxeter groups. And if you set the parameters VI to be 1, what you see you get is TSI squared is 1. And this vanishes. And so this is a sort of a, a deformation of the group algebra. You would get you would get back the group algebra of the Coxeter group by setting all the parameters equal to 1. So this is a deform, deformation of the group algebra. And this occurs very naturally in the following situation. This is why I'm presenting it to you. <coughs> because the very first time such an algebra was uh, com computed is uh, in this situation. We have. Uh, the permutation representation on the cosets of the Borel subgroup. So this is a special case of Harris Chandra induced modules. So this is you take the free field representation of T, our diagonal subgroup, you inflate it back to representation of B, then it's still the free field representation of B, 
And when you induce it, then the induced drift field representation is just permutation representations of the coset. So this is the coset, uh, the representations of the cosets. And uh, if you look at its endomorphism algebra, so this is h t comma one in our new uh, uh, notation. And then it turns out, this is the theorem by Ibahori and Matsumoto, going back to the 1960s, I guess. This is an Ibahori Hecke. Yeah, this is an Ibahori Hecke algebra of W over K, and the parameters QI are obtained by B with respect to these fundamental reflections SI, which come from the from the definition. They come from the definition of, uh, of the BN pair. You see in the BN pair. Uh, N modulo B intersect N was generated by elements SI to square to, to, to 1. Mm -hmm. These are these SI. Are so, there other deformations? Sorry? Are there other deformations? Yeah, I think so, yes. Uh, of course, this is just one. This is the one which occurred, appeared first. And of course, this is the one <coughs> we use. And uh, it I mean, you will see that it appears uh, in other places as well. Okay. So this is the deformation of the group algebra of the Coxeter group by just deforming the quadratic relation in this sense. And it's very important. It's, I mean, it's, it's really uh, a construction with a, which appears uh, in many other places as well. Now let's so is there a, a natural reason why, why you would expect that this dimension, for example, so the dimension is now the same as the yeah. of the right group? Is there yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's not so difficult to see because of these uh, braid relations and, and Matsumoto's lemma, which says that if you have a, uh, um, if you have two elements, It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a nice and easy consequence of Matsumoto's lemma, which says that uh, in, as well, in the Coxeter group, as well as in these, uh, um, in these algebras, in these deformed algebras with these presentations, uh, two elements can be transformed in one another if they are equal by a sequence of braid relations. And therefore, what you do is you define an element TW starting from a W and then uh, in, the, in the Coxeter group, write it in a reduced expression in, the principle, in these uh, fundamental generators, and then look at the corresponding expression TS1, TS2, TS3, and so, and so on. And Matsumoto's lemma tells you that this TW so defined is independent of the reduced expression, <coughs> because you have the same braid relations. Yeah, and one reduced expression can be transformed to another one in the Coxeter group by a sequence of braid relations. And therefore this one TW can be seen to be equal to any other TW which is obtained from another reduced expression. And therefore, uh, I mean, when you see these T TWs generate, the, so they form a, gener uh, a, 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 a generating set as a, as a vector space, and then you have to show that they are linearly dependent, and this is done by producing a nice representation. I wouldn't call it a free algebra. It's a vector space. Huh? Where is a free algebra? It's a free K algebra theory, right? <coughs> it's not uh, ah, a K algebra. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, God, we have this right. This free is uh, is too much. Yeah. Nonsense. There is no such yeah, word like nonsense. Just to be absolutely clear, these TW are by definition the products of the TSI. Yes, yeah. you can. You can put yeah. word to the SI. If you start, if you take a W, yeah, you write it as a reduced expression in the Coxeter group, and then you have a corresponding expression in the TSIs, and then you show that this element in this algebra is independent of a reduced expression. Yeah. Now comes another fundamental concept, that of a custodial module, a work which is also borrowed from the theory of modular forms. So a module for the group algebra is custodial if it's not a submodule of some Harish-Chandra-induced module. 
sub-module, a sub-representation. And then we get the following classification. So this is a, f a, a first, if you like, labeling, first sort of labeling for the modules, for the simple modules. Every simple module up to isomorphism is labeled by a triple, L, M, and theta. L is a Levy subgroup of G, up to conjugacy inside the group G, so G is a finite group. M is a simple module, which is cuspidal as a KL module. Remember that L is itself a group with a BN pair, so it makes everything makes sense for L. And theta is a simple module for this endomorphism algebra. So I would like to call this pair LM, where L is a Levy subgroup and M is a cuspidal module for L, a cuspidal pair. So this is due to Harishchandra, I think, for the general linear group, 1968, and then Lustig generalized it in characteristic zero to all finite uh, reductive groups, and Meinolf Geck, Guntermanne, and myself uh, generalized it to all characteristics different from P, positive characteristics. So the label L can be G itself? Yeah, okay. these are the cuspidal modules. Yes. So this escape our attention in a sense, yeah? But I'm going to say something about this. This is, well. So let, just let's, let me just sketch what has to be done to arrive at such a classification, okay? So take a simple module. We start with a simple module. We want to find this triple L and theta. Well, we take a Levy subgroup L of minimal order such that V occurs as a sub-representation in some Harishchandra and used module for M. Everything is finite. Such an L must exist. In the worst case, it's G itself. And then the module is cuspidal. If it's not cuspidal, there must be an L which is smaller than G. Then M is simple, since this Harishchandra induction is exact. If it had a sub-module, you could take the sub-module and you could get something, yeah? And then M is cuspidal. M must be cuspidal because Harishchandra induction is, is transitive and exact. I mean, if, you had a, if, it, if this M came from a smaller Levy subgroup of L, it would be a Levy subgroup of G, and then uh, you would get it from something even smaller. So th this is all rather easy. But what is not so easy is that this pair is uniquely determined from the module V up to conjugation in G. For this, you need some sort of Mackey theory for Harishchandra induction and Harishchandra restriction to make this unique. So you get a unique label. And now, in the second uh, sequence of step, <coughs> we decompose this Harishchandra-induced module. Remember, V is a, v is a, a submodule of this into a direct sum of indecomposable modules. And then this is not completely trivial. One sees that each of these has a unique simple submodule. This is not trivial. So the components, the indecomposable the direct commands itself have a unique simple submodule. This one has to prove. And also one simple module, just as a, yeah, it's a unique simple submodule, not just a sum of the simple. I mean, it's no, no, it's a unique submodule. They are, they have a unique simple submodule, and also, moreover, uh, two such components, two such indecomposable direct elements, are isomorphic, if and only if their unique submodules are isomorphic. So this one has to prove. This follows from from theorems of, of Green, Sandy Green, Savada, uh, Caban, uh, in connection with properties of the endomorphism algebra of this, uh, of this module, which have to be proved. So this endomorphism algebra has some nice ring theoretical uh, structure, and it has to be proved. And therefore, V is one of these submodules because V is a submodule of this. It must occur as a submodule in one of these indecomposable summands. And uh, so V determines itself one of these isomorphism types. But by fitting correspondence, the indecomposable direct summands correspond to the, to the indecomposable direct summands of the endomorphism algebra, which itself correspond to the single modules. 
from the end of the so I'm thinking of this decomposable thing as some upper triangular set of matrices yeah. where you have the same block on the diagonal. Then that's the uniqueness of the simple No, no, no. no. That's a unique, a unique simple model. There's just one well, sub module. I think that you use sub modules in two different sense. Here mm -hmm. you mean really a sub module and not a sub representation. Yeah? I think that's the, the problem. You just a sub -module. against the software, yeah? There is a unique uh, invariant subspace of smallest dimension, a unique one, a unique one. Yeah, it's really a unique submodule. And this gives rise to the definition of Harishchandra series, which is very important in the classification of the, of the simple modules. Two simple modules are said to lay in the same Harishchandra series if they have correspond to the same cuspidal pair. In other words, if they are submodules of the same Harish-Chandra induced modules for L and M. So all the submodules that occur for one cuspidal pair correspond to one Harish-Chandra series. And the Harish-Chandra series is determined by this cuspidal pair, which remember is unique up to conjugation. Uh, and uh, so this partitions the set of all simple modules in this Harish-Chandra series. And uh, the messages in order to, to determine this Harish-Chandra series, in a sense, or to, to get hold on this, you have to find these cuspidal pairs. And the elements in a Harish-Chandra series are in bijection with simple modules of this algebra, this endomorphism algebra. So this, this classification, so this is a theoretic classification. This leads uh, to the three tasks. We have to determine the cuspidal pairs. So we have, in particular, we have to know which modules for the group G are cuspidal. We have to find the classification of them. And then for each of these cuspidal modules for, for the Levy subgroups, we have to compute somehow this endomorphism algebra. We have to somehow get hold of this on this endomorphism algebra and then we have to classify the simple modules for the endomorphism algebra. Yeah. Okay, what is the state of the art? If the characteristic is zero, everything has been done by Lustig. So we classify the cuspidal modules for the group G and this is then of course by induction known to all the Levy subgroups of G. Uh, so they arise from etal cohomology groups of the linear Lustig varieties, so the construction is, is rather deep. And there is no elementary construction known so far. In all cases, HLM is an ibahori hecke algebra, as I have defined. So an ibahori hecke algebra is with respect to some Coxeter group. Which Coxeter group? Well, this is the group. Uh, WGLM, this is a relative wild group. I will introduce it uh, on another slide, on the next slide. So it's always an ibahori hecke algebra, and the parameters of this ibahori hecke algebra, the VI, are known, and the representations are known. Why? In characteristic zero, it is known because this is a deformation, a semi simple deformation of the group algebra. Uh, it has the same representation theory. It, actually, it's isomorphic to the group algebra, although it's deformation. It's isomorphic to the group algebra. Another, so this is uh, Tietz deformation theory, and Lustig has found an explicit isomorphism, which is uh, rather, rather deep. Yeah? So this WGL is the relative Y group. Essentially, it's the normalizer. So. It's the normalizer of L. So WGL is the normalizer of L modulo L. Uh, the N is the N from the BN pair. This is just introduced to avoid trivialities. If you would just take the normalizer, say in GLN2, L is the diagonal torus, which is the trivial group. Yeah, then uh, the normalizer would be all of G, and this is not what you want. Yeah? Uh, an alternative definition using the underlying algebraic group would take the normalizer in this finite group G of the algebraic Levy group L. Yeah? And we don't move too much. 
This is naturally isomorphic to a subgroup of W if you choose your maximum torus with uh, defining W inside this, this L, which you can. And then this WGLM is just the stabilizer of N. Yeah? N is a module for L. Take the normalizer of L, take its stabilizer. This is this relative value group. And it's a deep theorem by Lustig that this is always a Coxeter group for all cuspidal pairs occurring in characteristic zero. This is not a triviality. One deep theorem. Now let's look at a small example. SL2Q, characteristic zero. There's only one Levy subgroup you can take, which is not G. Uh, this is the group of diagonal matrices. This is the only proper Levy subgroup. It's a cyclic group of order Q minus one. The relative Y group, or the Y group of T, is the, of course the Y group of G. It's a group with two elements generated by this matrix, modulo T. The group with two elements, so it's just a coxeter group. Uh, S2, yeah? If you have a simple K, T module T is a cyclic group. A simple K, T module K is characteristic zero. It has dimension one and is by uh, it's, it's cuspidal because there is no smaller limit subgroup. It is cuspidal. And then uh, and the, the induced module, the Harishandra induced module, always has a degree Q plus one, since this is a module induced from the Borel subgroup, which has a de uh, index Q plus one. Yeah. Now, two things can happen. This relative Y group with respect to N can be the trifid group. And then there is just one module inside here, and this means that the corresponding uh, module is simple and of dimension Q plus one. And there are many to reduce the representations of SLQ of dimension uh, Q plus one. And the second case is, it's the whole of, of, of T, which happens for the free field representation, for example, M. Uh, and and if, Q, if, if, if Q is odd, there is another one. Then this is all of the wide group. It has two uh, irreducible representations, and then this is the sum of two non-isomorphic simple pages. Two non-isomorphic. And so characteristic zero, these dimly composable summits are simple? And not always, but uh, if this is uh, K, then they have to be simple, because uh, the head and the socle have to be isomorphic, and uh, if they were not simple, you had a non trivial isomorphism mapping the head onto the socle and then the, uh, the endomorphism algebra would be larger. In this case, in general, they are not simple, but if the endomorphism algebra is trivial, they are. They have to be. But it's, isn't it always semi-simple? Yeah. yeah, it's always, ah, yeah, 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 it's always, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, of course. In characteristic zero, it's okay. In characteristic zero, yeah, you don't have to worry. But in characteristic, L different from P. It also is simple if the endomorphism algebra is simple, but for other reasons, yeah? Sorry. Yeah? So what is the state of the art in characteristic not equal to zero? <clears throat> we know that this is a sort of an Ivarovic algebra, a twisted Ivarovic algebra, so the multiplication relations are twisted by a co-cycle. I'm not going to be more precise. And this is not always a Coxeter group, but an extended Coxeter group. So it's a sort of a group graded algebra. Or yeah, yeah, it's not always a Coxeter group. It's an extension of a Coxeter group by a finite group. Yeah. Um, but in general, the parameters of this algebra, even if we know that it's a twisted Ivarovic algebra, the parameters are not known, and therefore we, the representation theory of this algebra depends on these parameters, so we don't really get a good hold uh, on, on, these, uh, on these algebras. If G is GLNQ, uh, Richard Dipper and Gordon James have proved everything uh, we want to know. Uh, as far as Harichandra series are concerned, we don't know. So we have a good set of labeling for the simple modules, even in, in characteristic L larger than uh, zero. But we don't have uh, the degrees of the irreducible representation. We still don't have the degrees. This is far. 
Uh, then there is a notion of a linear characteristic, which I'm not going to define, where everything can be reduced to GLNQ if G is a classical group. Uh, and this is also uh, known, in a sense, as far as Harishchandra series are concerned. In general, in general, the classification of cuspid pairs is wide open. So there is still a lot of work to do, and this is one of my areas, one of my fields I'm working in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs>